Romans chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, acknowledge him to his honor and to his praise. Now, every knee means that even those that don't believe now someday will bow their knee. It's going to be an exciting time, isn't it? Well, at least it's going to be for us. I don't know how exciting it will be for people who have spent their whole life not believing. Or for that matter, even people who say they believe but who have spent their lives compromising. Let's look at the next verse. So each of us shall give an account of himself, give an answer in reference to judgment to God. Now, let's, let's just look at that soberly for a minute. However many years we have here and how much fun we have and no matter how great it is. Someday, each one of us is going to stand before God and give an account of our lives. So, if you think it's hard once in a while to hang on to your faith and remain a believer in the world we live in today, you're going to be awfully glad when that day comes. That you don't have anything to be ashamed of. Because all those who believe never come up for condemnation, the Bible says in John 3, 18. All those who believe. I don't even think the things that we give an account to God for are necessarily going to be, am I going to heaven or am I going to hell as believers? I think a lot of it is going to be maybe like, what did you do with your time? What did you do with your money? How did you treat people? Do you have any good fruit to show from your life? You know, everybody today is busy, 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 busy. If I said to you, are you busy? Most of you would say yes. If I said, are you too busy? Most of you would say yes. But you know, God never asks us to be busy. He asks us to be fruitful. I said, God never asks us to be busy. And sadly, I think sometimes we get so busy <laughs> doing nothing, except having our busy schedule frustrate us, that we don't end up with any really good fruit from our lives. So I want you to, I want this to be a sila, which means pause and calmly think about that. I want this to be a sila moment for us in this conference this weekend, just as we get started. Someday every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and every man will stand before God and give an account, not of somebody else, but of himself before God. And I want to make sure that all of you watching by television, no matter what country you live in, no matter what language you speak, if you're hearing this message now, especially if you are someone who has not made the commitment to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, to love God with all your heart, I want you to consider now that the time will come when you will stand before God and give an account of your life. And although that is a sobering thought and maybe one that we would prefer not to think about, it is something that we must think about because the day will come. And if I, if I don't share that with you, then I'm not doing my job right before God. And when I stand before him and give an account, he may say, well, you know, why didn't you preach a little more meat and make sure that the people really understood that the day is going to come when they're going to get given account for their life. So I think that's something that we need to be fully aware of. Can anybody smile and say amen, amen, amen. Now, actually tonight I want to talk to you about avoiding deception. And in Matthew chapter 24, a chapter that's about the signs of the end times, how many of you think we're living in end times? Okay. Well, interestingly enough, every generation has thought that, including Paul's generation. But if Paul thought he was living in the last days, I guess that, that we're living in the last or last days than Paul was. 
So whenever he's coming back, we're a lot closer than Paul was. And Paul told people that they needed to live carefully. They needed to live soberly and seriously and, and not like a bunch of airheads who thought tomorrow was never going to come because tomorrow will come. And he told them to be careful about their behavior, that they were to be lights in a dark world. And I don't think we realize sometimes as believers in Christ, you know, the Bible says Christ in us, the hope of glory. Well, you know, do you know that as a believer, you are the hope of God's glory? Come on, I'll get that. You are the hope of God ever getting any glory. We, the believers in Jesus Christ worldwide, we are the lights supposed to be in a dark place, the salt of the earth. Believers representing God are what gives life flavor. Without God, there's no flavor. Everything's bland and dull and boring. And it's a sobering thought to think that not only is Christ in me the hope of me ever being glorious, but it's the hope of him getting the glory that he deserves. Another kind of sobering thought. So Jesus said, he gave signs of the end times. And one of the things that he said was that deception was going to be great in the last days. He said, now you be careful that no one misleads you. He gave us a responsibility. Well, you know, gee, I, I, I hope I never get deceived. I wish I would have never gotten deceived. No, we can't have that kind of passive attitude. A passive attitude is an open door for Satan to come in and wreck our lives. We have to be active. We have to be aggressive. We have to stay informed. And deception is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. And there's so much of it. Deception means that we believe a lie. Somehow or another, Satan has convinced us of something that's not true, but if we believe it, it becomes true for us. And I would venture to say, and please don't be offended when I say this, but it's possible that almost everybody in this building, I always say almost everybody, because then if somebody wants to get offended by it, you can think you're the one I'm not talking to. <laughs> so I would venture to say that almost everyone in the building is probably deceived in some area of your life, even right now including me there's something that you may think is true so for you it's become your reality although it's not true at all you may think that you've done something you can't be forgiven for but that's not true however if you believe that then you'll never receive the forgiveness that's already been provided for you because everything that we receive is through believing. So if Satan can get us to, re to believe the wrong thing, then we're constantly receiving from him rather than receiving from God. And we just get confused. We don't even know what's wrong with us. If you believe that you're unlovable, if you expect to be rejected, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. We've opened the door for the enemy, and he'll come in and wreck our lives. Well, the only answer to deception is, guess what? Truth. I don't know that we even begin to realize how valuable this book is. I love to hold this book up before the world and just think about the millions of people maybe right now are, that are just looking at this wonderful book. People in Africa, people in India, people in Asia, people in Europe, people all over the world, people back in the backwoods of the Amazon jungle, people in grass huts, people everywhere. And I just want to tell you, this is the hope of the world right here, the Word of God. Jesus said, if you continue in my Word, you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Hallelujah. What an awesome thing. That was one of the first scriptures that God gave me some understanding on back in 1976 when I became a serious Christian. And I always say when I became a serious Christian because I was a Christian a long time before I became a serious one. And I believe that, that I knew enough of Christ. 
I understood salvation by grace. I really believe that Jesus died for my sins. And I believe that if I would have stayed, even in that condition, I would have went to, to heaven when I died. But I always like to say it like this. I had enough of Christ to stay out of hell, but not enough to walk in victory. So let me ask you, how much of Jesus do you want in your life? Do you want just barely enough to get squeak by every day and hopefully sneak in the back door of heaven? Or would you really like to be a light in a dark world? Would you really like to be used? Would you like to be fruitful? Would you like to be someone that God can be proud of? Then you know what that means? There's two paths that we can walk as believers. The narrow path and the broad path. The narrow path leads to life. The broad path always leads to destruction. Now the broad path is easier to stay on, obviously. <laughs> Got a lot of space there for you and all your fleshly baggage and all, you know. Get on the narrow path and there's some stuff that has to start going because there's no, no room for that. It's so important, I really believe that it's so important that we begin to take a more sober look at how we're living and what we're saying to the world and what the church is saying to the world. And we need to each one of us make sure that we're doing our utmost to glorify God through our lives every single day. Amen. I'm not real sure why God picked this place for me to preach this message. The last town I was in, they got to hear all weekend about how much God loves them and the grace of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God and that God will change them and they don't have to get into works of the flesh. I mean, I started out that conference. I said, this is all going to be about you. Well, this is going to be about you too, but it's more about how to get rid of you. This weekend, we're going to say goodbye to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, but the joy is going to increase. And the peace is going to multiply. You know, by the end of Genesis 3, or by the beginning of Genesis 3, <laughs> first book of the Bible, Satan had already managed to deceive Eve. Two chapters and a little bit of another one, however long that took. So I wonder how much deception there is today after he's had all these multiplied thousands and thousands of years to work on people. We believe a lot of wrong things about God. A lot of people believe that God is the source of their problems. Well, God, why did you do that to me? Why did you let that happen to me? That's not true. But you're never going to know the truth about God unless you know his character through his word. Well, I've tried to read the Bible, Joyce, and I can't understand it. No, 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 no. First of all, I don't believe you can read the Bible and understand it unless you receive Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit because he's going to give you the revelation. But you can start out, and as you begin to read, God will fill your life, and he'll enlighten you. But there's too many translations of the Bible today that make it easy to understand. There's no excuse to say that you can't understand it. You know what, you know what, you know what I started with back in, when I was in my 20s? You know what I read? A children's Bible story book. And there's no shame in that. If you can't get it any other way, then go get a children's Bible story book. Or get my little Everyday Zoo series, you know. <laughs> Start out with the Everyday Zoo series that was written for four-year-olds, okay? But don't say, I can't understand the Bible. Like, that's an excuse to never get into it. This is the greatest book in the whole world. <laughs> Revelation 12... Revelation 12 teaches us that Satan is the deceiver, the great deceiver. That's all he does. The word deception, if you studied in the Greek dictionary, means to cheat, to deceive, to beguile. That which gives a false impression. 
And I just thought, just briefly, how many false impressions there are out in the world today? What would happen if all the veneer was stripped off of everything? Wonder what kind of ugliness we would see. How many advertisements promising this is your answer to everything are just nothing but false impressions? How many people give a false impression? Even how many religious people give a false impression? They act very religious and holy when they're with their other so-called holy religious friends, but at home behind closed doors, they are a nightmare and a terror. But you know, when that day comes and we stand before God and give an account of ourselves, I think we may stand there stripped <laughs> of all of our veneer. So maybe that means it's time to take a really good look at ourselves. And you know, back in 1976, when God really touched my life and I'd had enough of religion and was having no victory in my life. And I say that that was when I began a serious relationship with God. One of the first things that happened to me was God began to make me take a serious look at me. It was time for me to stop blaming everyone else for my problems, take responsibility for my life, take responsibility for my behavior, stop blaming my past for all my bad behavior and make a decision that it was time to grow up. I told Matt Redmond tonight, I said, we may not have a lot of laughing this weekend. He said, oh, you always say that, but you'll get the people laughing. Well, you know what? I hope you enjoy this one way or the other, but either way, we have to have some of these meter, meteor, stronger, 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 you know, Jesus occasionally said, solemnly, I say unto you. <laughs> and that's not such a bad thing either. Verily, verily, <laughs> I say unto you. And I just want us all to make sure, you know, I guess this is going to sound kind of corny, but sometimes I actually just feel sorry for God. And I know he don't need our pity, but I find myself apologizing to him for other people. It's like, God, I'm so sorry that you have to put up with the nonsense that's in the church today and the nonsense that's in the world today. And I'll tell you what, the world is in a mess. It's in a mess. And I'm trying to preach this weekend on how to be godly in an ungodly world. We've got to be so careful that we don't get deceived by all the compromise that's out there. We can't keep compromising. We have to know what we believe and be prepared to stand on what we believe and for what we believe, even if it means that we have to suffer for it sometimes. And suffering is not a very popular word in the modern day church. I mean, you can almost get stoned for saying the word suffering. But Jesus said, you're much better off to suffer for righteousness sake than to suffer as a sinner. <laughs> Amen. It means crafty, to be baited, a snare, a trap, a wandering from the right path. Now listen to this particular, this came from the Vines Greek Dictionary. The word deception rep represents those who deceive with empty words and they belittle now listen to this, they belittle the true character of sin. Now, this is where we're at today. You see, sin, we don't, we don't even call sin, sin anymore. Sin is now our addiction, our bondage, our problem, our hang up, the thing we struggle with, or the most ridiculous thing that has now become is our right. It's our right to do sinful things. Well, you know what? God will protect your right to go to hell if that's what you want to do. 
I mean, the Bible does say, I set before you life and death, choose. Oh, yes, we have the right of free choice. Well, you know what? God is long-suffering and merciful. He is patient, and he tries really hard to draw people out of sin and into his forgiveness and his mercy. And I believe, really, that that's what he's trying to do right now, even through my mouth. And obviously, you know, you're all here, and I appreciate you being here. And I'm not talking just to you tonight, or even maybe mainly to you, but to all the people all around the world who flip into a program like this and think it's an accident. And God's trying to speak to you. He's trying to let you know how much he cares about you and how much he loves you, and, <clears throat> and that he's got a much better life for you than, than what you're living. And maybe you don't know very much about God, and you think that you're beyond his reach. But let me tell you something. God's got a long arm, and he's able to reach down and lift you out of your pit and save you. But the word repent, first of all, means that we have to be sorry for our sins. Not our oops, our hang up, our addiction, our bondage, the thing we struggle with. But we have to be sorry for our sins. God, I am a sinner, and I am sorry for my sins. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But all may be justified and made right with God through the blood of Christ. The promises of God are for all. We can all be made brand new. Every single one of us. God is long-suffering and merciful. He is patient, and he tries really hard to draw people out of sin and into his forgiveness and his mercy. And I believe, really, that that's what he's trying to do right now, even through my mouth. And obviously, you know, you're all here, and I appreciate you being here. And I'm not talking just to you tonight, or even maybe mainly to you, but to all the people all around the world who flip into a program like this and think it's an accident. And God's trying to speak to you. He's trying to let you know how much he cares about you and how much he loves you. And, and that he's got a much better life for you than, than what you're living. And maybe you don't know very much about God and you think that you're beyond his reach. But let me tell you something. God's got a long arm and he's able to reach down and lift you out of your pit and save you. But the word repent first of all, means that we have to be sorry for our sins, not our oops, our hang up, our addiction, our bondage, the thing we struggle with, but we have to be sorry for our sins. God, I am a sinner and I am sorry for my sins. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but all may be justified and made right with God through the blood of Christ. The promises of God are for all. We can all be made brand new. Every single one of us. But we have to realize that the time is going to come when we are going to give an accounting of our life. And I think maybe, you know, maybe like never before, I'm, con I'm concerned about this. Or maybe it's a fresh concern that God is putting in my heart because it's really what he's wanting me to share right now. And as I said, I'm not just sharing for the people in here, but for all the people out there that are so deceived, people that have been deceived even by religion, people that have gone to church thinking that, well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go to church, maybe God can help me. And then you went to a church where maybe you didn't find much of God. Maybe you just found a lot of judgment and criticism. And maybe people didn't know what to do with you. Maybe, maybe you had so many problems, they didn't know what to do with you. But you know, Jesus didn't die so we could have a religion. He died so we could have a relationship with him through Christ. And even if you tried a few churches and they didn't work for you, Jesus is calling out to you, even right now, through my voice. And he's saying, come. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God wants to give you rest for your weary soul. There's a number on your screen right now. If you'd like to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you call that number and what somebody at my office is going to pray with you and explain to you what it means to be born again, what it means to be saved. We don't want you to be lost. Don't be deceived.
In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, I'd like us to look at it. It tells us something that's going to happen in the world, and it is happening right now, and it's really scary. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Well, the lines are becoming blurred in our society. How many of you know that? Things that we knew were wrong 20 years ago, people aren't so sure they're wrong today. And that's very dangerous. And it concerns me because what are people going to believe by the time another 20 years go by? If no standard is firmly set for the church, and it's our responsibility, those of us who are in the pulpit, those of us who have teaching and preaching gifts, it is our responsibility to be very clear with people, yes, God loves you. Let, yes, His grace will cover your sin. There's no sin that you can't be forgiven for. And there's no limit on how many times you can be forgiven. But we can't be forgiven for a sin that we're, that we're not repentant of and that we're going to persistently stay in the middle of and think that God is going to understand it and somehow we're going to be a special case and it's going to be okay. Please clap a little louder. It will help me. Oh my, if you want to know the truth, my spirit was looking forward to this, but my flesh wasn't looking too much forward to it. Because I know people's wheels start turning, oh my God, what is she saying? What is she saying? Well, you figure it out. You just get with God and you figure out what I'm saying. Some of you already know. You already know exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> But I really wouldn't love you if I didn't say it. Woe to those. Do you know what woe is? You know, I used to say all the time, I don't know what woe is, but there's a lot of it in the Bible, and I don't think I want any of it. Well, I finally got brave enough to study the word in preparation for this, and woe is like calamity and the absolute worst kind of misery that anybody could ever possibly have. <laughs> yeah. And if you think you're religious, maybe you better go to Matthew 23 and read the woes that Jesus pronounced over the religious people. Woe to those who are like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Woe to those who bundle up heavy burdens and lay them on men's backs but won't even help them carry that burden. And you know what religious legalism does to you? It gives you all kinds of rules to follow and no help to follow them. That's why we've got to understand grace and we've got to understand the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have to understand that anything that God calls us to, He enables us to. Do you hear me? Anything that I preach to you this weekend, you don't have to be afraid. You can't do it because if it's anything that God has asked us to do, then He enables us to do it. And the problem that we've had for so many years is we've been told what to do, 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 but nobody's told us how to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be enabled to do it. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses. Power. Amen? Power. It almost kind of scares me to think of the job that we have as believers in Christ. And even the job that I feel that I have in training up the believers to go out and do the work of the ministry. I want all of you to be willing before this weekend's over to take a much more sober look at your life and at your behavior. Because the world can't see our heart, it only sees our behavior. Now I know God sees our heart, but he does help tell us to get out there and behave right, too. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. That doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. And Jesus there is there for the mistakes. He's there for the imperfections. We can keep being forgiven every day. We can keep having a fresh start every day. But we can't get a lazy, sloppy attitude that it doesn't matter. 
And we can't just blend in. Come on. We don't need a big Christian blender. We don't need to just blend in. Even the Israelites had all kinds of problems because they took with them a mixed multitude. They didn't keep themselves pure. They got mixed up with too many sinful ideas and too many sinful people and too many idol worshipers and it got in them. And they turned away from God. Let's read Isaiah 5, 20 and 21 together. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent and shrewd in their own sight. Woe to them. The worst kind of misery. We need to know what's right and we need to stand up for it. In Isaiah 10, 1 and 3. Are you all enjoying this? Hey, can I just make a suggestion? If you know any flaky Christians, go get them and bring them back here tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Some of you are thinking there's not room in the building. <laughs> okay, now, here we go. We're going to dive off into something here for a minute. Woe to those judges who issue unrighteous decrees. <laughs> And to the magistrates who keep causing unjust and oppressive decisions to be recorded. Wow. <laughs> and verse 3. And what will you do in the day of the visitation of God's wrath and in the desolation which comes from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you be deposited for safekeeping? Where will you put your wealth? And with whom will you leave your glory? I think people today make decisions in the pride of their own mind. I have a position of power. I have a position of authority. And this is what I think, and it's going to become law. But it's a dangerous, dangerous situation. I have a book here that Dave shares, shares out of called Original Intent by David Barton. And um, I'm just going to read you a few things, just a few. In recent years, clashes over religious expressions have been among the most frequent controversies decided by federal courts, with the U.S. Supreme Court having issued numerous rulings on the subject, a previously unprecedented practice in American history. So they have began to rule on religious expressions made in public places, especially if they're made in a school or uh, a courtroom or on any kind of federal property, saying that you can't mix church and state, which is a total misunderstanding, a total deception about the First Amendment. That's not what it meant at all. Matter of fact, I can read it to you. It's very simple. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So basically, what the First Amendment says, if you understand it properly, is that the government needs to stay out of religion. I, I mean, it doesn't say that the church needs to stay out of government. It's promising us that, I mean, the whole reason why people came here and started this nation from England was to get away from religious tyranny. Our whole nation, all of our laws were founded on the Word of God. No offense to you guys from England. We're great friends with England now. but And the same thing has happened in many other nations. Can I, can I show you something? Great example. This is a bottle of Italian salad dressing. Now, you know, when you leave it sit, it's not active. All the good stuff sinks to the bottom. And you got this stuff up here that is really just pretty tasteless and greasy. 
It's amazing what happens if you mix it up with the good stuff, but all by itself, it's kind of like, who wants that? Well, we're kind of like this as Christians sometimes. We let all the Jesus stuff sink to the bottom. And then everything we're putting out is kind of tasteless. It's like, could I have a little salt, please? Come on, some of you are with me. You'll get this. Could I just have a little bit of salt, please? Well, now, here's what happens when you try to separate God from things. <laughs> Whether it's the schools, or the government, or society, or anything else. Everything you get is tasteless. <laughs> Come on, without God, nothing has any flavor. There's no flavor in anything without God. None. But when you mix them up, now when God's involved in everything, we got something here now we can eat and enjoy. It really does not take a genius to figure this out. The First Amendment has been understood to be a wall erected between church and state that must be kept high and impregnable. <laughs> and we will not abide the slightest breach. Therefore, these, these are actual court rulings. Now, that doesn't mean that they've been made laws for all of us to follow, but it means that somebody sued somebody and the court had to rule on it. And so these are some of the rulings that have been made over the last number of years. A citizen riding a public bus cannot give a fellow rider a book containing a Bible story. Anderson versus Milwaukee County, 2006. Somebody probably handed this person a gospel tract or a Bible story book, and they got offended and went and filed a lawsuit. And whatever judge that was before said, okay, well, we're going to rule that you can't do that. So in that county now, they can't do that. Give me a break. Why couldn't you just tell the guy, if you don't want it, don't take it? Here's the thing that I don't get. Everybody getting their rights is taking away my rights. And that's the part I don't like. So here's the problem. If you don't want, look at me, everybody watch me. If you don't want, if you really don't want to believe in God, I'm sorry for you, but don't. However, leave us alone. Amen? Because I'm just as happy as I can be. And I'm just so free, and I've got so much peace, and my life has been restored, and I'm not afraid to give an account of my life to God. Amen. I mean, you really would not believe how ridiculous this gets. It's unconstitutional for a historic memorial even to the fallen or the slain to contain a cross as part of its display. No matter how many previous decades that memorial has been standing. And there are like six different cases. The city of Eugene, La Mesa, San Diego, on and on and on. Got all the years here. We have this book on the resource table. <laughs> is that it is unconstitutional for a public cemetery to have a planter in the shape of a cross. For if someone were to view that cross, it could cause emotional distress. <laughs> and thus cause an injury. <laughs> well, it distresses me if I can't see the cross, thank you. So I would personally like to see it, it calms me down. I've got a huge one on the back of our building at the office and I love it. It's unconstitutional for a nativity to scene to be displayed on public property. It's unconstitutional for a Christian to pray public prayers that reflect their own personal faith and belief. In Minnesota. <laughs> and it's a state employee was barred from parking his car in the state parking lot because he had a religious bumper sticker on his bumper.
these are not laws. It doesn't mean you have to be, oh my gosh, you mean I can't do that anymore. But what these cases become is they become precedents, which never should happen either. So then the next person who wants to cause a fuss about this same thing, a lawyer can go back and say, well, see, this precedent was set over here. And so now we have to follow that precedent. And you may say, oh, what are you telling me all this stuff for? This is no concern of mine. It is absolutely a concern of every single one of us. Because here's what's going to happen. If we don't understand what's happening, then it's just going to keep happening because we're not going to resist it at all. We're not going to stand up for our rights. We're not going to fight for them. One of my grandchildren, one of my little grandchildren told a student in a public school, God bless you when she sneezed. And the teacher came to my grandchild and said, oh, honey, you can't say that here. <laughs> Oh, yeah? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. God bless you, bless you, bless you. And see, what we can't do, oh. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I won't say that anymore. This is when you got to stand up. This is when you got to stand up for what you believe in, and you got to say, what do you mean I can't say that? God is the center of my life, and I will talk about him as much as I want to talk about him. And you can't tell me that I can't. And you know what? Really, they know they can't. And if you back people down, they will back down. You go to the school board. If you have to, you hire a lawyer. You say, I can't afford that. There, there's a group called the Lions Defense Fund that have trained 2,200 lawyers, and they take cases like this pro bono to help people fight these goofy court cases where our, our rights are being taken away from us. Don't be afraid to stand up for your rights. Amen? Anyway, this just gets sillier by the minute, so. I don't have any more time to waste on it. There's just so many goofy things. I love what one, one of our founding fathers said. I'm just going to read you this. I think I'm going to have to do a part two on this message tomorrow. I'm going to get done. Um, he said, well, first of all, George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> it's not possible. You can't do it. God created it all. It all belongs to him. It doesn't belong to us. <laughs> God created the world. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. He makes the sun stay in the sky. He put the stars up there. He put the sand there and told the ocean where to stop. It all belongs to God. What do we think is going to happen to us if anybody is ever successful in getting rid of God? First of all, he's not going away, but he doesn't like being expelled from school and ignored and taken out of everything. I, I, I am embarrassed by the way people treat God today. I am embarrassed by it. And so we're his hope of glory. We have to be lights in a dark place. Now, let me tell you something. The Bible says we're to be in the world, but not of the world. Now, and I'm going to get around to this some more tomorrow, but... That doesn't mean that you have to act like a weirdo from a foreign planet called Christian planet. <laughs> to be godly in an ungodly world doesn't mean that you want to act like some religious nut or fanatic. There are real problems, in a, there are real people in a real world, world with real problems, and we have real answers, and we need to act like some way, somehow, we can relate to them. Yeah. Amen? Be friendly with unbelievers. Do things for unbelievers, but make sure you're affecting them and they're not infecting you. Amen? So, you know, you don't, you, you don't need to go to work with like, I am an alien from Christian planet. I am an alien from Christian planet. I am an alien from Christian planet. Wearing your Jesus Saves t-shirt and got your headphones on and walking around speaking in your Christianese. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Woohoo! Glory to God. I mean, they're just gonna they're just gonna go, what is your problem? But if somebody at work that has been mean to you, 
You hear their cars broken down and they're not going to have one for three weeks and you offer to go by their house and pick them up and bring them to work every day. Now you've got a message. Now you've got something that makes sense. By this, by this love, one new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. By this shall all men know. The world doesn't know us by our bumper stickers and our Christian jewelry and our Christianese language. They don't understand that. But I'll tell you what they do understand. They understand mercy. They understand love. Let me give you an example of how to be. Dave worked in the world in the engineering field for a long time before he came into the ministry. And everybody, Dave, everybody knew Dave was a Christian, not because he was obnoxious about it, but they just know after a while. And um, for a while, he taught a Bible study at work, and, you know, the guys knew about that, and they could come if they wanted to. And, and uh, so a guy came up to Dave one time and just told him a really dirty joke. And Dave didn't laugh, and he just looked at me and said, you know, why, why do you do that? You know, I don't want to hear that stuff. Well, he took a stand for what was right. But here is the most important thing to me out of the story. The next day when Dave came to work, he was friendly with that guy and treated him just as if nothing had ever happened. And here's where Christians make their mistake. Once you have to do something like that, we either don't do it at all, we compromise, or once we do it, then we get weird. We get weird about it. So now we separate ourselves and we don't talk to them and you know, <laughs> If we could ever learn to just stand for what we believe in, but go ahead and treat everybody in love. Come on.